SpaceX isn't slowing down. Just days after Flight 9, the company has already moved into pre-launch testing for Flight 10, completing the crucial booster static fire test recently. The big question now is how soon SpaceX can complete the Flight 9 mishap investigation, implement corrective actions, and line up Flight 10 for launch? Let's break it down. Following Raptor engine installation, system integration, and final outfitting of electrical, hydraulic, and avionics systems, Super Heavy Booster 16, assigned to Flight 10, rolled out to the launch site early Wednesday for the static fire test. Upon arrival at the launch complex, teams quickly lifted the booster onto the orbital launch mount and began preparing for the test campaign. On Friday afternoon, Booster 16 underwent a full-duration static fire test, firing all 33 Raptor engines for a sustained 8 seconds. This critical test verified the booster's plumbing, valve operations, ignition systems, and overall engine performance before proceeding to an actual launch. With the test complete, the booster will now return to the production site for inspections and final integration before launch. SpaceX has officially confirmed that Flight 10 will attempt a booster catch using the launch tower arms, unlike Flight 9, where the booster attempted a controlled splashdown in the ocean. Meanwhile, Ship 36, the upper stage assigned to Flight 10, is currently undergoing vehicle integration procedures. It recently received its aft flaps, finalizing its aerodynamic structure. Engine installation is also underway, after which the vehicle will proceed to static fire testing. Following Flight 9, SpaceX officials Shana Diaz, Director of Starship Engineering, and Elon Musk shared updates outlining the path toward Flight 10. Diaz confirmed that key fixes from Flight 8 worked as intended, but Flight 9 revealed a previously unseen failure mode. While that raises new challenges, it also shows SpaceX is moving beyond earlier issues and continuing to push the boundaries of reusability. Diaz also stated that internal data suggests Flight 10's turnaround will be faster than Flight 9, which was delayed by major hardware upgrades, repeated engine tests, and extended FAA reviews. Musk echoed this statement, saying the next three Starship launches are targeted at intervals of three to four weeks, placing Flight 10's likely launch window between June 17th and July 1st. Beyond hardware readiness, the timeline now hinges on the FAA's ongoing mishap investigation, which focuses solely on the upper stage failure. The booster loss isn't under formal review, as it was expected, and falls under SpaceX's pre-approved test-induced damage exemptions. This is because the vehicle was flown under deliberately high-risk conditions, including a steep re-entry angle, planned engine-out scenarios, and drag-optimized flight profiles. Since these carried a known failure risk, the booster anomaly didn't trigger a formal mishap response, meaning there's no regulatory holdup on the booster side. The main concern now is the upper stage propellant leak observed during Flight 9, which led to loss of attitude control and the vehicle's failure to complete a controlled re-entry and splashdown. That fix will need to be validated during Ship 36's upcoming static fire before it's cleared for flight. Dias remarks suggest the leak is relatively minor and straightforward to resolve and shouldn't cause prolonged delays like the long campaign between flights 8 and 9. With Booster 16 already completing pre-launch testing, propellant leak fixes underway, and Ship 36 approaching its final static fire, all indicators, backed by Dias and Musk's statements, point to a Flight 10 launch later this month. In parallel with Flight 10 preparations, SpaceX is actively testing hardware for the next Gen Block 3 Super Heavy boosters. This structural prototype and the ongoing evaluations around it are critical to Starship's long-term future. So let's break it all down in detail. Test Tank 17, also known as Booster 18.1, represents the aft section of the next Gen Block 3 Super Heavy and is built to validate critical structural and fluid system upgrades. A major change is the taller internal header tank. In current generation boosters, the header tanks are relatively small and are used exclusively to store propellant for the landing burn. However, this new taller design suggests SpaceX may be planning to store additional propellant here for the boost back burn as well. Currently, propellant for this crucial maneuver is sourced from the main tanks. However, during the post-separation flip, slosh in the main tanks can disrupt propellant flow and compromise engine reignition. While baffles installed inside the main tanks mitigate this issue to some extent, they're not entirely effective. A dedicated, undisturbed header tank ensures a stable flow of propellants to the engines, improving both boost back and landing burn reliability. The test tank also features a redesigned aft plumbing layout with dual propellant lines exiting at 60 degrees angles, matching the dual quick disconnects introduced on Block 3. 
This confirms testing of the updated fluid interface architecture. Another major upgrade is the larger CNC machined thrust puck, likely milled from solid stainless steel. This improves structural stiffness and thermal performance, crucial as Block 3 and Raptor V3 phase out traditional engine and dome shielding. Previously, shielding protected against engine failure and re-entry heating. With Raptor V3's higher reliability and lower risk of explosion, shielding is no longer standard. To compensate, Block 3 boosters will include a new active thermal protection system. This consists of stainless steel tiles with water cooling ports that eject water during re-entry, creating a thermal barrier. A secondary insulation layer beneath the tiles, similar to that used under Starship's heat shield, provides additional thermal protection. Also present on Test Tank 17 are new hold-down interfaces for Pad B's clamp system. Unlike Pad A's complex bulky clamps that grip the booster aft skirt from below, Pad B uses simpler clamps that lock into dedicated slots on the aft section. This modification significantly speeds up the clamp and release process, improves efficiency, reduces moving parts, and enhances operational safety. Tank 17 will serve as the first full-scale test of this clamping mechanism. Finally, the tank exhibits improved manufacturing quality, cleaner welds and more precise plumbing, indicating tighter tolerances and improved structural integrity. At Massey's, the tank was mounted on the new Can Crusher stand, designed to simulate the structural loads a booster endures during liftoff, ascent, and re-entry. The stand is equipped with several hydraulic systems. A set of embedded actuators beneath the platform applies upward force to the aft dome, mimicking thrust loads during flight. Six large radial pistons, not yet installed, are designed to interface directly with cutouts in the tank, extending internally to apply compressive forces to the internal header tank. By squeezing and flexing the header tank, engineers can study deformation patterns, weld strength, buckling thresholds, and propellant feed stability under dynamic stress. This configuration allows SpaceX to validate the header tank's structural behavior under flight-like conditions such as launch, flip maneuvers, deceleration, and re-entry loads. Additionally, a metal cap fitted with axial actuators, still awaiting installation, will simulate axial forces similar to what a booster endures during ascent. In the absence of both the internal radial actuators and the axial load cap, the test stand applied only partial loading during the recent tests, meaning Tank 17 was not subjected to the full spectrum of mechanical stresses the rig is designed to simulate. Still, the campaign yielded valuable baseline data. The first test of Tank 17 followed standard testing procedures. The tank was filled with liquid nitrogen to replicate cryogenic temperatures and pressures, while the pistons applied mechanical stress. This served as a baseline to validate the performance of the taller header tank, revised aft dome, and updated plumbing under cold, stressed conditions. After data collection, the tank was safely detanked. A second, more demanding test was conducted on June 2nd. The tank was cryofilled and held in a fully loaded state for five hours under continuous hydraulic stress. This long-duration test aimed to evaluate the tank's behavior under prolonged cryogenic pressure and axial loading. Engineers tracked thermal contraction effects on stainless steel components, verified weld and seal integrity, assessed plumbing performance, and gathered initial data on the structural response of the new thrust puck and aft dome under axial stresses. Following the hold, detanking began, but instead of rapid draining, it was done in staged phases, pausing at multiple fill levels. This likely allowed engineers to monitor changes in structural stress, deformation, and fluid behavior as pressure and propellant mass gradually decreased, mimicking in-flight conditions during ascent, descent, and landing. The full test campaign lasted nearly 28 hours, making it the longest Starship test to date. The extended duration suggests SpaceX is collecting highly granular data to refine Block 3's cryogenic structural, and mechanical envelope before advancing to full-scale flight hardware. Further testing of Tank 17 is expected in the coming days, with top-mounted actuator cap and radial pistons installed. Starship 37, assigned to Flight 11, completed two consecutive cryogenic proof tests at Massey's on May 30th, a rare and aggressive testing cadence that shows growing confidence in the vehicle's hardware. These tests verified the integrity of propellant plumbing systems and provided critical data on structural performance under simulated flight conditions. The ship is now back at the production site for engine installation and integration work in preparation for static fire testing. Meanwhile, construction of the Giga Bay has officially begun, with crews initiating sheet pile installation. These sheet piles serve as foundational retaining walls, 
stabilizing the soil to allow for deep excavation and structural support. Once foundation work is complete, vertical construction of the Gigabay will proceed. An advanced production facility intended to support the rapid-scale manufacturing of up to 1,000 starships per year. For an in-depth look at the Gigabay project, check out my previous video linked in the description. Now, let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. A catastrophic loss of attitude control just moments before touchdown led to the failure of iSpace's Hakuto R Mission 2, marking a major blow to private lunar exploration. Let's break down what went wrong during the landing attempt. Hakuto R Mission 2, carrying the Resilience Lander, was launched on January 15 aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket, aiming to become the first non US commercial spacecraft to land on the moon. After separating from the rocket's upper stage, the lander began a low energy transfer trajectory fuel-efficient but time-consuming, to reach lunar orbit with minimal propellant use. On May 6, Resilience entered a highly elliptical lunar orbit. Over the next three weeks, it executed a series of braking burns to lower and circularize its orbit, achieving a stable 100 km circular path by May 28. Orbiting the Moon every two hours, the spacecraft completed all final system checks in preparation for landing. The landing attempt began on June 5, targeting Mare Frigoris in the Moon's northern hemisphere. From a 100 km altitude, Resilience initiated a deorbit burn and reoriented itself vertically using a pitch-up maneuver. It then entered the braking phase, with its main engine firing continuously to reduce altitude from 25 km down to just 1 km above the surface for the final landing maneuvers. However, less than two minutes before touchdown, contact was lost with the spacecraft and the live feed cut off. Final telemetry showed the lander descending too fast, suggesting it hadn't decelerated enough for a soft landing. Mission Control made multiple attempts to re-establish contact, scanning for signals, but no response was received. Hours later, iSpace confirmed the mission had ended in failure, concluding that Resilience had likely crash-landed. Preliminary analysis pointed to a possible malfunction in the laser altimeter, a critical sensor used to determine altitude by bouncing laser pulses off the lunar surface. If the altimeter misjudged the lander's altitude, it may have delayed deceleration commands, resulting in a crash landing. The exact cause of the altimeter failure is still under investigation, with iSpace launching a full failure review. Had the landing succeeded, Resilience would have conducted a 14-day surface mission using a suite of advanced scientific instruments to study the lunar environment. It also carried the Tenacious rover, built to scout the landing zone and collect regolith samples for in situ analysis. Resilience was iSpace's second failed lunar landing attempt. Its first mission in 2023 ended similarly when the lander hovered at a 5 km altitude, miscalculating its height until it ran out of fuel and crashed. Despite two back-to-back -back failures, the company remains committed to lunar exploration and is already planning Hakuto R Mission 3, currently targeting a 2027 launch, potentially in collaboration with NASA's Artemis program. The growing political fallout between Elon Musk and President Trump, triggered by a budget dispute and amplified by Musk's public criticism, is now sending shockwaves through America's space sector. Before things escalated publicly, the first shock came quietly. In a surprising move, Trump abruptly withdrew Jared Isaacman's nomination as NASA administrator just days before a critical Senate vote. Isaacman, billionaire entrepreneur, Shift 4 CEO, and commercial astronaut, had been nominated in December 2024 to succeed Bill Nelson, signaling a shift toward private sector leadership at NASA. He had cleared all background checks and committee reviews, with confirmation appearing imminent. Trump cited a vague, thorough review of prior associations for the withdrawal, promising a new mission-aligned nominee. However, many linked the decision to Isaacman's close ties with Musk, who had recently criticized the administration's space budget cuts. Isaacman blamed political forces with axes to grind about Musk for sabotaging the nomination. You know, there were some people that, um, you know, that had some axes to grind, I guess, and, uh, and I was a, a good visible uh, target. Musk voiced disappointment, stating it is rare to find someone so competent and good-hearted as Isaacman, and noted the stark contrast with Trump's earlier glowing endorsement, in which he had described Isaacman as the ideal leader to usher NASA into a bold new era. Isaac Mann's removal stunned the aerospace community, which had hoped his leadership would inject bold vision and private sector efficiency into NASA's struggling programs. Then, on June 5, things escalated sharply. Trump announced plans to terminate all federal contracts and subsidies involving Musk's companies, including SpaceX, claiming it would save billions and billions. In response, 
Musk briefly threatened to decommission Dragon, NASA's only operational crew vehicle for reaching the International Space Station. Though he later walked back the statement, the threat caused alarm across the industry. The consequences would be severe. Without Dragon, NASA would have no domestic option for crewed ISS access, potentially forcing renewed reliance on Russia's Soyuz at high financial and political cost. More critically, SpaceX is contracted to safely deorbit the ISS by 2030 using a modified version of the Dragon spacecraft. Without cooperation from Musk's team, that mission, and the entire ISS timeline could be in jeopardy. All of this unfolds just weeks after Trump proposed slashing NASA's budget by 24%, threatening the Artemis program, SLS, and multiple deep space missions. But there's a flicker of resistance. On June 5th, the Senate Commerce Committee released its own reconciliation bill that pushes back, allocating nearly $10 billion to fully fund Artemis, the Lunar Gateway, and Mars missions, along with $1.25 billion to sustain ISS operations through 2030. In short, NASA is now caught in the crossfire of political tensions, budget threats, and leadership instability, just as global space competition intensifies. Let's hope the agency weathers this storm and stays on course. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.